Lingual nerve injuries have a number of causes. Now, one of the more common causes would be the removal of an impacted third molar. So if you take one of these out and you do a flap, sometimes you may wish to get some of the lingual tissues off of the bone back there to get a little bit more visibility. <clears throat> now, when you do this, sometimes what happens is you may not be subperiosteal or you may be stretching or reflecting that flap with too much tension. When you do that, you stretch the nerve and you can damage that nerve. So there's a lot of debate about whether or not this should even be done. So some practitioners want to have an instrument in under the lingual tissues and they're adamant that it should be there to protect the nerve. Others say that you shouldn't be manipulating or touching the tissues in this region basically at all. So I can't tell you what the best approach is. This is totally up to you. Just be aware that if you choose to be reflecting those tissues or getting them out of the way, <clears throat> there is a chance that you'll damage that lingual nerve. Now, another cause of lingual nerve injuries would be injections. So say if we do a lower block, for example, it has been suggested that roughly about 5% of our blocks can end up having that needle contacting or piercing through that lingual nerve since it lies kind of medial and anterior to where that inferior alveolar nerve lies. So as we're passing through to do that injection, we're actually hitting those fibers. And if that patient happens to be open very wide and the fascicles are kind of stretched and there's not very many of them and the needle actually pierces through them, you can lead to a complete anesthesia of the tongue, uh, ipsilaterally, of course. So the patient then will have troubles with taste and sensation, which is very inconvenient for them. Most times these things are going to heal up on their own or kind of resolve spontaneously over a certain period of time. But you have to keep a close eye on that patient and we'll go over this in a minute. An intraneural hematoma is something else that can lead to sensory disturbances of the lingual nerve or lingual nerve injuries. And basically what happens there is you're injecting and basically piercing into that lingual nerve and within it you hit a vessel that then bleeds inside the nerve compressing the nerve fibers and it can actually undergo sort of a reactive fibrosis that then damages that nerve or causes some issues with it that then need time to heal. The final thing here which hasn't been proven yet but is implicated in this so you need to be aware of it would be the use of articane or prilocaine. So articane and prilocaine are higher concentration anesthetics. They come as 4% uh, in the carpule. Basically then what they're suggesting is that that higher concentration can have somewhat of a toxic effect on the nerve. Now this may or may not be true but if it's out there in the literature and someone experiences a lingual nerve injury and you were using articane or prilocaine, well that may not look very good on your part because they've got something to go by. Now you may wish to stay clear of these if you're doing lower blocks. For full disclosure I use articane all the time even when I'm doing blocks. I haven't noticed this anecdotally, I haven't seen any issues with this, but maybe something to be aware of just to stay safe. If you have a patient that suffered a lingual nerve injury and you want to get an idea of what their possible outcome could be, you could look at these Seddon or Sunderland classification systems. So these are classification systems that basically aim to take the severity of a lingual nerve injury and then correlate it to a potential prognosis for a given patient. Now let's say you got a patient that phones you a week after you took a tooth out and they say, ah, oh, you know, everything's feeling really good except my tongue is still numb. Is that normal? And you're going to say, no, that's not normal. You should come to see me. So the patient will come see you a week after their extraction. And what you're going to do is three tests. And you're going to write down the results of these tests with good notes. So basically explain what they're telling you and what they're feeling as you're doing these tests. And you're also going to do something called mapping. So you're going to draw basically a picture of the tongue and you're going to divide it into sections that you can test individually to keep very detailed notes of what the tongue is sensing when they're in to see you. So for the first visit, you're going to do the three tests. One is a light touch test. Another one is a pinprick test. And the third is a two point discrimination test. So the light touch test is basically using a cotton swab. So you just take something that you'd use for your topical application and you touch those various areas of the tongue very lightly to sweep it across there. If they cannot feel that, then what you want to do is do the pinprick test, which is using the end of your explorer, which of course is very sharp. And normally if you poke your tongue with it, you'd know right away. You're going to do this very gently in those areas of the tongue that you've mapped out on your diagram. If they can't feel it, you'll do it a little bit more firmly. And then if they can sense it somewhere, what you want to do then is determine just how functional those nerves are. So how dialed in are they to the sensations? Are they just vaguely sensing something 
or are they totally fine in that area? The way you figure this out is to do the two point discrimination test. So you would use a caliper, for example, say like you might have for doing a denture and you would open it up to about five millimeters, for example, five or six millimeters even to start with. So you got the two beaks six millimeters apart, we'll say you're going to touch an area of their tongue. When you do that, you want them to tell you if they're feeling one or two beaks touching their tongue. So they, they feel one or two pokes, basically. If they feel one and you're six millimeters apart, this is not normal. And that indicates that there's some degree of nerve dysfunction there. Now, it also gives you a bit of a roadmap for later. So let's say that you do six millimeters and they say, ah, oh, yeah, no, that's just one thing touching. But really, there's two. Then what's going to happen is you're going to get them back a week later and you're going to test it again at six millimeters. Now, this time they might say, oh, yeah, there's two things touching my tongue. So then you could shrink it down to five millimeters and test it. And they might say, yeah, I can feel two things. And then you go to four millimeters and basically you shrink that increment each time until you get into an accepted range for nerves, which would be about two millimeters to four millimeters of separation being detected as one object. So that's just a rough idea of what this is. You should read up more about it to do it appropriately, but that's just a crash course in the two-point discrimination test. Now let's say that you saw the patient one week after the extraction, they have no sensation. You get them back a week later, same thing, nothing's changed. You try one more week and it's now been three weeks and there's absolutely no improvement, no tingling, no discomfort, no anything, it's just totally dead. What you want to do is refer them to the oral surgeon. Now the oral surgeon is going to do the same thing. They're going to test this patient. They're going to get some baseline assessments of the tongue and the history. And then what they're going to do is consider potentially sending this patient to a neurosurgeon to have this basically repaired microscopically. So if a patient is going to get a repair done, it's usually because this is causing a major issue for them. So they're having a lot of troubles eating, speaking, or it's just really affecting their quality of life. Now, the best surgical outcomes occur if surgery is initiated within three months of that injury. So that's why you don't mess around too much. If you go three weeks and there's absolutely no improvement, you've got to get them referred so that they can get on this prompt uh, surgical schedule, I guess, or promptly refer them so that they can get scheduled to get this repaired in time. There are the most positive outcomes for surgeries that are done in the first six months. So maybe a patient doesn't get back to you right away. Maybe it's been three months and you think, oh, it's too late for surgery. There's still a chance that they may have a positive outcome from a surgical intervention if it's within six months. So it's not too late.